Book One, Chapter One of Letters of Travel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tim Bulkley of BigBible.org. From Tideway to Tideway, 1892 to 95. In sight of Monadnock. From Letters of Travel by Rudyard Kipling. After the gloom of grey Atlantic weather, a ship came to America in a flood of winter sunshine that made unaccustomed eyelids blink. And the New Yorker, who is nothing if not modest, said, This isn't a sample of our really fine days. Wait until such and such a time comes, or go to such and such a quarter of the city. We were content, and more than content, to drift aimlessly up and down the brilliant streets, wondering a little why the finest light should be wasted on the worst pavements in the world. To walk round and round Madison Square, because that was full of beautifully dressed babies playing counting out games, or to gaze reverently at the broad shouldered, pug nosed Irish New York policeman. Wherever we went, there was sun, lavish and unstinted working nine hours a day, with the colour and the clean-cut lines of perspective that he makes. That anyone should dare to call this climate muggy, yea, even subtropical, was a shock. There came such a man, and he said, Go north if you want weather, weather that is weather, go to New England. So New York passed away upon a sunny afternoon with her roar and rattle, her complex smells, her triply overheated rooms, and much too energetic inhabitants, while the train went north to the lands where the snow lay. It came in one sweep, almost it seemed, in one turn of the wheels, covering the winter-killed grass and turning the frozen ponds that looked so white under the shadow of lean trees into pools of ink. As the light closed in, a little wooden town, white, cloaked and dumb, slid past the windows and the strong light of the car lamps fell upon a sleigh the driver furred and muffled to his nose turning the corner of a street now the sleigh of a picture book however well one knows it is altogether different from the thing in real life a means of conveyance at a journey's end but it is well not to be ever curious in the matter for the same American who has been telling you at length how he once followed a kilted Scots soldier from Chelsea to the tower out of pure wonder curiosity as his bare knees and sporran will laugh at your interest in just a cutter. The staff of the train. Surely the great American nation would be lost if deprived of the ennobling society of brakeman conductor, pullman car conductor, negro porter and newsboy. Told pleasant tales as they spread themselves at ease in the smoking compartments of snowings up the line to Montreal, of desperate attacks, four engines together and a snowplow in front on drifts thirty feet high, and the pleasures of walking along the tops of goods wagons to break a train, with the thermometer thirty below freezing. It comes cheaper to kill men that way than to put air brakes on freight cars, said the brakeman. Thirty below freezing? It was inconceivable till one stepped out into it at midnight, and the first shock of that clear, still air took away the breath as does a plunge into sea water. A walrus sitting on a wool pack was a host in his sleigh. He wrapped us in hairy goatskin coats, caps that came down over our ears, buffalo robes and blankets, and yet more buffalo robes, till we too looked like walruses and moved almost as gracefully. The night was as keen as the edge of a newly ground sword. Breath froze on the coat lapels in snow nose became without sensation, the eyes wept bitterly because the horses were in a hurry to get home, and whirling through the air at zero brings tears. But for the jingle of the sleigh bells, the ride might have taken place in a dream, for there was no sound of hooves upon the snow. The runners sighed a little now and again, as they glided over an inequality, and the sheeted hills around were as dumb as death. Only the Connecticut River kept up its heart and a lane of black water through the packed ice. We could hear the stream worrying round the heels of its small bergs. 
Elsewhere there was nothing but snow under the moon. Snow drifted to the level of the stone fences, or curling over their tops in a lip of frosted silver. Snow banked high on either side of the road, or lying heavy on the pines and the hemlocks in the woods, where the air seemed by comparison as warm as a conservatory. It was beautiful beyond expression, nature's boldest sketch in black and white, done with a Japanese disregard of perspective, and daringly altered from time to time by the restless pencils of the moon. In the morning, the other side of the picture was revealed in the colours of the sunlight. There was never a cloud in the sky that rested on the snow line of the horizon as a sapphire on white velvet. Hills of pure white, or speckled and furred with woods, rose up above the solid white levels of the fields, and the sun rioted over their embroideries till the eyes ached. Here and there on the exposed slopes the day's warmth, the thermometer was nearly forty degrees, and the night's cold had made bald and shining crust upon the snow, but the most part was soft powdered stuff ready to catch the light in a thousand crystals and multiply it sevenfold. Through this magnificence, and thinking nothing of it, a wood sledge drawn by two shaggy red steers, the unbarked logs diamond dusted with snow, shouldered down the road in a cloud of frosty breath. It is the mark of an experience in this section of the country to confound a sleigh, which you use for riding, with the sledge, which is devoted to heavy work and it is, I believe, a still greater sign of worthlessness to think that oxen are driven, as they are in most places, by scientific twisting of the tail. The driver, with red mittens in, on his hands, felt overstockings that came up to his knees, and perhaps a silver-grey coonskin coat on his back, walks beside, crying, Gee-haw! even as is written in American stories, and the speech of the driver explains many things in regard to the dialect story which at its best is an infliction to many. Now that I have heard the long unhurried drawl of Vermont, my wonder is not that the New England tales would be printed in what, for the sake of argument, we will call English and its type, but rather they should not have appeared in Swedish or Russian. Our alphabet is too limited. This part of the country belongs, by laws unknown, to the United States, but which obtain all the world over to the New England story and the ladies who write it. You feel this in the air as soon as you see the white painted wooden houses left out in the snow, the austere schoolhouse, and the people, the men of the farms, the women who work as hard as they with, it may be, less enjoyment of life, the other houses well painted and quaintly roofed that belong to judge this, lawyer that, and banker such a one. All powers in the metropolis of six thousand folk over by the railway station. More acutely still, do you realize the atmosphere when you read in the local paper announcements of chicken suppers and church sociables to be given by such and such a denomination sandwiched between paragraphs of genial and friendly interest showing that the countryside live and without slaying each other on terms of terrifying intimacy the folk of the old rock the dwellers in the older houses born and raised hereabouts would not live out of the town for any consideration and there are insane people from the south, men and women from Boston and the like, who actually build houses out in the open country, two and even three miles from Main Street, which is nearly four hundred yards long, and the centre of life and population. With the strangers, more particularly if they do not buy their groceries in the street, which means and is the town, the town has little to do, but it knows everything and much more also that goes on among them. Their dresses, their cattle, their views, the manners of their children, their manner towards their servants, and every other conceivable thing is reported, digested, discussed, and rediscussed up and down Main Street. Now, the wisdom of Vermont, not being at all times equal to grasping all the problems of everybody else's lives with delicacy, sometimes makes pathetic mistakes and the town is set by the ears. You see, therefore, the towns of a certain size do not differ materially all the world over. The talk of the men of the farms is of their farms, purchase, mortgage, and sale. 
recorded rights, boundary lines and road tax. It was in the middle of New Zealand, on the edge of the wild horse plains, that I heard this talk last. When a man and his wife, twenty miles from the nearest neighbour, sat up half the night discussing just the same things that the men talked of in Main Street, Vermont, USA. There is one man in the state who is much exercised over this place. He's a farm hand, raised in a hamlet fifteen or twenty miles from the nearest railway, and greatly daring. He has wandered here. The bustle and turmoil of Main Street, the new glare of the electric lights, and the five-storied brick business block frighten and distress him much. He has taken service on a farm well away from these delirious delights and, says he, i had been offered twenty-five dollars a month to work in a bakery in New York but you don't get me to know New York. I've seen this place and it just scares me. His strength is in the drawing of hay and the feeding of cattle. Winter life on a farm does not mean the comparative idleness that is so much written of. Each hour seems to have its sixty minutes of work, for the cattle are housed and eat eternally. The colts must be turned out for their drink, and the ice broken for them if necessary. Then ice must be stored for the summer use. Then the real work of hauling logs for firewood begins. New England depends for its fuel on the woods. The trees are blazed in the autumn just before the fall of the leaf felled later, cut into four foot lengths, and as soon as the friendly snow makes sledging possible, drawn down to the woodhouse. Afterwards, the needs of the farm can be attended to, and a farm, like an arch, is never at rest. A little later will come maple sugar time, when the stately maples are tapped and as the sap begins to stir, and be ringed with absurd little buckets. A cow being milked into a thimble gives some idea of the proportion which are emptied into cauldrons. Afterwards, this is the time of the sugaring off parties, you pour the boiled syrup into tins full of fresh snow, where it hardens, and you pretend to help and become very sticky and make love, boys and girls together. Even the introduction of patent sugar evaporators has not spoiled the love making. There is a certain scarcity of men to make love with, not so much in towns which have their own manufactories and lie within the lover's Sabbath day journey of New York, but in the farms and villages. The men have gone away. The young men are fighting fortune further west, and the women remain forever as women must. On the farms, when the children depart, the old man and the old woman strive to hold things together without help, and the woman's portion is work and monotony. Sometimes she goes mad to the extent which appreciably affects statistics and is put down in census reports. More often, let us hope, she dies. In the villages, where the necessity for heavy work is not so urgent, the women find consolation in the formation of literary clubs and circles, and so gather to themselves a great deal of wisdom in their own way. That way is not altogether lovely. They desire facts and knowledge. That they are at a certain page in a German or Italian book before a certain time, or that they have read the proper books in a proper way. At any rate, they have something to do that seems as if they were doing something. It has been said that the New England stories are cramped and narrow. Even a far-off view of the iron-bound life whence they are drawn justifies the author. You can carve a nut in a thousand different ways by reason of the hardness of the shell. or thirty miles across the hills, on the way to the Green Mountains, lie some finished chapters of pitiful stories. A few score abandoned farms, started in a lean land, held fiercely so long as there was anyone to work them, and then left on the hillsides. Beyond this desolation are woods, where the bear and the deer still find peace, and sometimes even the beaver forgets that he is persecuted and dares to build his lodge. And these things were told me by a man who loved the woods for their own sake and not for the sake of slaughter a quiet, slow-spoken man of the west who came across the drifts on snowshoes and refrained from laughing when I borrowed his footgear and tried to walk the gigantic lawn tennis bats strung with hide are not easy to manoeuvre 
If you forget to keep the long heels down and trailing in the snow, you turn over and become as a man who falls into deep water with a life belt tied to his ankles. If you lose your balance, do not attempt to recover it, but drop, half sitting and half kneeling, over as large an area as possible. When you've mastered the wolf step, you can slide one shoe above the other deftly, that is to say, the sensation of paddling over a ten foot deep drift and taking shortcuts by buried fences is worth the ankle ache. The man from the west interpreted to me the signs on the snow, showed how a fox, this section of the country is full of foxes, and men shoot them because riding is impossible, leaves one kind of spore. Walking with circumspection, as becomes a thief, and a dog, who has nothing to be ashamed of but widens his four legs and plunges, another. How coons go to sleep for the winter, and squirrels too, and how the deer on the Canada border trample down deep paths that are called yards, and are caught there by inquisitive men with cameras, who hold them by their tails when the deer have blundered into deep snow, and so photograph their frightened dignity. He told me of people also, the manners and customs of New Englanders here, and how they blossom and develop in the far west on the newer railway lines, when matters come very nearly to civil war between rival companies racing for the same canyon. How there is a country not very far away called Caledonia, populated by the Scotch, who can give points to a New Englander in a bargain and how these same Scotch Americans by birth name their townships still after the cities of their thrifty race. It was all as new and delightful as the steady scrunch of the snowshoes and the dazzling silence of the hills. Beyond the very furthest range, where the pines turn to a faint blue haze against the one solitary peak, a real mountain and not a hill, showed like a gigantic thumbnail pointing heavenward. That's Monadnock, said the man from the west. All the hills have Indian names. You left Montastic Quiet on your right coming out of town. You know how often it happens that a word shuttles in and out of many years, waking all sorts of incongruous associations. I had met Monadnock on paper in a shameless parody of Emerson's style, before ever style or verse had interest for me but the word stuck because of a rhyme in which one was crowned coeval with monad Knox crest and my wings extended touch the east and west later the same word pursued on the same principle as that blessed one Mesopotamia led me to and through Emerson up to his poem on the peak itself the wise old giant busy with his sky affairs who makes us sane and sober and free from little things if we trust him. So Monadnock came to mean everything that was helpful, healing and full of quiet. And when I saw him, half across New Hampshire, he did not fail. In that utter stillness, a hemlock bough, overweighted with snow, came down a foot or two, with a tired little sigh. The snow slid off, and the little branch flew nodding back to his fellows. For the honour of Monadnock, there was made that afternoon an image of snow of Gautama Buddha, something to squat and not altogether equal on both sides, but with an imperial and reposeful waist. He faced towards the mountain, and presently some men in a wood sledge came up the road and faced him. Now, the amazed comments of two Vermont farmers on the nature and properties of a swag bellied god are worth hearing. They are not troubled about his race, for he was aggressively white, but rounded waists seemed to be out of fashion in Vermont, at least they said so, with rare and curious oaths. Next day all the idleness and trifling were drowned in a snowstorm that filled the hollows of the hills with whirling blue mist, bowed the branches of the woods till you ducked, but were powdered all the same when you drove through, and wiped out the sleighing tracks. Mother Nature is beautifully tidy if you leave her alone. She rounded off every angle, broke down every scarf, tucked the white bedclothes till not a wrinkle remained, up to the chine of the spruces and the hemlocks that would not go to sleep. Now, said the man of the west, 
as we were driving to the station and alas to New York all my snow tracks are gone but when that snow melts a week hence or a month hence they'll all come up again and show where I've been curious idea is it not imagine a murder committed in the lonely woods a snowstorm that covers the tracks of the flying man before the avenger of blood has buried the body and then a week later the withdrawal of the traitorous snow revealing step by step the path Cain took the six inch detrail of his snowshoes each step a dark disc on the white to the very end there is so much so very much to write if it were worthwhile about that queer little town by the railway station with its life running for all outward seeming as smooth as the hack coupés on their stay mounting and within disturbed by the hatreds and troubles and jealousies that vex the minds of all but the gods for instance I know it's better to remember the lesson of Monadnock and Emerson has said Zeus hates busybodies and people who do too much that there are such folk a long nasal drawl across Main Street attests a farmer is unhitching his horses from a post opposite a store he stands with the tie rope in his hand and gives his opinion to his neighbor and the world generally but them there Andersons they ain't got no notion of etiquette end of chapter one in sight of one Recording by Tim Bulkley of BigBible.org